Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Charlton Live, sponsored by the British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom and Bathroom Insulation. My name is Louis Mendes. This is an emergency broadcast on a Wednesday evening after the Charlton Athletic head coach, Michael Appleton, uh, was given his marching orders after five months at the club last night. Following the 3-2 home defeat against Northampton Town, that means it's now 10 games without a win uh, for the Addicts uh, in League One. And six, de- is it five, six defeats in seven, five defeats in six? We're on a bad run, pretty bad run. Uh, good evening to everyone who's uh, joining me on the screen. As you can see, we've got a pretty packed house to try and discuss the ins and outs uh, of what's happened uh, over the last 24 hours uh, or so. So Joe Puddy for Nathan Muller, Mark Newbury, Sue Gallup, Ben Cloak, and Tom Wallin uh, join us this evening, as do plenty of you guys in the live chat. Good evening to everyone who's joining us uh, live on YouTube. Let us know what you made of the decision to sack Michael Appleton uh, last night. Let us know if you fear for our League One future uh, with the Addicts sitting just four points above uh, the relegation zone. Of course, we want to know your suggestions for who may come next uh, in SE7. Uh, make sure you put your comments in the chat or you can tweet us at Charlton Live. Uh, or you can email us studio at charltonlive.co.uk. We will get to as many messages as possible, but obviously we might not be able to get to all of them. So uh, I won't go around and introduce everyone one by one because we'll be here all night. So let's go straight into it. Joe Puddy for top of the screen there, Joe, following the dismissal of um, Michael Appleton last night. Your thoughts, your, your initial reaction? Well, I wanted him out before Christmas. So uh, for me, it's been long, long overdue. Um uh, it's uh, it it become untenable for him um we we just needed we needed a fresh start uh we are struggling at league position um we're only heading in one direction lots of players coming in through the door lots of reasons to be happy but you can't throw away the goodwill you're earning by continuing with a man that that doesn't have the fans behind him because if you don't have the us behind you then it's going to be an uphill battle for you as a manager yeah nathan when when the news came in it was only half an hour after the game finished last night that that we heard that the Michael Appleton was fired. So, I mean, it was quite clear that something was going on over the weekend, despite the, the club's denials and obviously Michael taking the game on Tuesday night, doing the press conference on Monday. But, yeah, we, have you been surprised by how all this has been handled? Um, I, I don't know. I'm not surprised of anything with this club anymore. But, um, I mean, in terms of uh, looking back at the press conference, I think it was quite uncomfortable watching it, I'll be honest, the pre-match. So, um it sort of it sort of tallied with how quick it was done, and if it was that you know that so quick after the final whistle, you can only assume. Well, I'm only assuming that the writing was on the wall before the game. So um, yeah, it didn't come as a surprise. I mean, it was just as soon as we went one down, and then Eden got sent off. I knew which way it was going. It just was a bit toxic. So I just think we put put it out of his misery a little bit now, and we can try and move forward. Whoever that is next. Mm, yeah, I mean. Um... Scott Taylor saying, for me, it's the performances from Boxing Day to date that have been uh, toxic. I'm honestly glad uh, he has gone. Yeah, I, I, I think in terms of a unanimous reaction from the fan base, Ben, I can't remember seeing so like seeing just a, a blanket reaction to a manager being sacked. Sometimes you get the odd person saying maybe you should have got a bit more time, but I haven't seen many of those. No, and as I said on Sunday, I think the ones that, well, I was feeling it a few weeks ago that I just didn't want to be that club that sacked managers so regular as we have been. You want them to be given a chance. And in Appleton's case, you wanted him to bring in his own players in this January window. I think if we were like eight or nine points off the playoffs and you thought it's probably not going to happen, but like we're, we're doing okay. We've had some injuries. He's bringing in his own blood. Let, let's see how it goes. Then you could have reasoned with it and gone, okay, like I am one of those supporters. I can see why supporters don't like him, but let, let's see how it goes. But as Joe was saying, at the moment, we're going in one direction and we're losing games or we're drawing games late on in games all the time. It's happening so regularly that we're obviously <laughs> not stopping the buck there and it's it's getting ridiculous isn't it i mean last night was just was just funny at the end there it happened again just absolutely ridiculous isn't it so yeah i think even supporters that are of that mindset of sacking managers sacking managers and yes we don't we don't want to be sat here doing emergency broadcasts having to um talk about another manager going but in this case i think it just got ridiculous and 
and yeah, even supporters that were a bit on the fence with it, I have to reason now that now's got to be the right time going into such a tough month in February. Yeah, so I mean, could you have seen foreseen any way that he could have turned around the form that we've been in? Like we say, 10, 10 games without a win now in, in League One. Um, the, the late goals just keep keep flowing as well. I think it's something like eight goals after 80 minutes in the last 10 games or so. We just don't seem to be able to see out games at the end or hold on to points or, or, or you know, hold on to three points when, when we were leading. I mean, was, was there any way back in your view and was there any way that this decision could have been wrong? No, absolutely not. I mean, I think I, I agree with Joe. I think that we, we, we sort of had discussions over a period of time now where we felt that he wasn't the right man for the job. Um, but I think when you, you go on that run and it, you're consistently losing a game in the last sort of 15, 20 minutes of a game, or even less than that, th there's got to be some sort of mentality, like mindset there that's like, what is it about the, the player's headspace but not only that what is it about the manager that then is not able to to put things right and just even hold on for a point um I know we've had periods of time in our history where we've got where we always call it our squeaky bum time like the last sort of five or ten minutes or if you get the seven minutes added on but that that's so concerning that it's that's happened so consistently and I don't think I can remember it happen happening for that long a period of time. It's happened before, but not for the amount of games in a row that it's happened. Mm, uh, Brazilians is saying, in my opinion, this uh, sacking was five months too late, uh, but better late than never. Imagine if we did sack him on day one. That, that does feel like the sort of thing we, we might start doing at some point. I think it happened to Leroy Rossini down at Torquay, where he was manager for 10 minutes. Uh, and, and something went wrong. I mean, Mark, what? Where did it go wrong, Mark? Can you pinpoint? You know, obviously we started off on a reasonable enough run under under Michael Appleton. I think he went something along the lines of seven or eight games undefeated in all competitions. Obviously, a lot of those were draws. But what, why? Why is it not work for Michael Appleton at Charlton? Can you only pinpoint it on the manager? Is there is there bigger causes at play there? Well, it's probably a couple of things. One, he came in after Dean, and then he managed to get um, a few games out of Chucks. He managed to get. He had. Um, young Lee Byrne as well. And we were saying, well, you know, if Dean had had these players, he'd have probably may have got those results as well. So I think, he, obviously, when we start losing players, it found him out tactically. And I said last Thursday, I, I just didn't feel anything about him. I said, it was strange for a manager. But after Saturday's result, I was feeling generally angry. And after last night's performance, I, I was livid and I was watching... I was at home and I was watching and listening to Scott and Curbs and when they got the message through, I was just like, yeah, that's there's absolutely zero surprise. Now, I don't think there was any surprise in the studio. So he, he was lucky when he came in, I think, because he had players fit, but then got found out and he got found out for being a mediocre manager and he talked about his record last week, but he never he's never really had one a record. So apart from going places and like annoying the fans. So you can't put a finger on one thing. <sighs> it wasn't even the right appointment at the time. It, it could have gone two ways, as it always can. But, you know, you can look back with hindsight and say, no, it wasn't. But with the other names who were bandied about at the time, was he the most experienced one of a bad bunch? You know, and we, and we gambled. We gambled, we lost. But, you know, now it's getting the right person. And uh, going again. Mm, yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned looking back with hindsight because I do remember our, our, our first show uh, after Michael Afton was given the job and looking at the fan reaction on the forums. And it generally was one of the most underwhelmed reactions I've ever seen from a support base. Um, not many people seemed massively excited. Of course, everyone said, look, we're going to have to give him a chance. He's here now. That, that, that's, we'll see, see how it works. Jay's saying uh, he should have got a bit more time. I'm guessing he's meant, meant to about half ten last night instead of quarter past ten when obviously the... Uh, that the statement went out. Tom, you were thoroughly not looking forward to doing the show because we've done this many times. Uh, this is the third emergency broadcast we've had this season, obviously after Dean going and, and Michael coming as well. Um, why does it keep happening to us? Why do we go through managers so quickly? Because 
when you're going through them at the rate of knots we do, it, it feels harsh to pinpoint only one thing. Obviously, Michael will, will have to put his hands up at some point and realise it didn't go very well for him here. But why as a club are we unable to get appointments right and to get recruitment right and to bottom out this curve that it feels like we've been on this downward spiral for a long, long time? Uh, ultimately, the ownership. Uh, and we haven't, we haven't had an ownership that are prepared to stay the course we haven't got an ownership that prepared to properly dig their hands in their pockets and back someone we haven't got an ownership that are prepared to accept what we are now which is a mid-table league one side and you need an ownership that are prepared to bide their time with somebody and give them a chance uh, and at the moment from from top to bottom in that I, I don't see that and you go all the way back to Roland and it's been the case you then look at the the next ownerships that have come you look at Sangard the moment we start to get into a bit of trouble, we panic. Um, and what, what's ridiculous is that the person who ultimately was probably the worst of every manager we've had since, I don't know, since one of Roland's little temporary blokes, probably since Carol Fry, has been given the longest amount of time. And that in itself is absurd. And I know I've defended the, the desire to just try and keep one manager. At no point did I ever want it to be Michael Appleton, but it appeared to be stuck on him. And I was like, okay, well, that's better than changing yet again. But if you go back through every manager we've had over the past three or four years, I would have happily accepted two, two and a half years under any of them to give them a chance to do anything. And all of them offered something more. I know you've said a few times, Louis, about the connection with the fans and the importance of that. I disagree slightly with that. And I think at, Appleton has fallen partly quick, more quickly because of that. But I think somebody like Dean having that that bond did go a little bit further. I think Ben Garner having a playing style went a bit further. I think Jacko being connected to the club went a bit further. You could argue all of those people deserve some time. And I don't think Apples did. But at least if you're going to give him it, you have to then see that through. And, and ultimately, they last night, they just couldn't. Right. And I and I totally get that. And I'm glad. But you look at the statement they've released today and it's the same as every other statement they put out. It's the same as the statement they put out after Dean. They've got no plan now. They don't know who they're going to get in. So we're back where we were. We're exactly back where we were. And you can't tell me if we'd have kept Dean Holden, we'd be any worse off than we are now because he had injuries. He had a terrible squad. They didn't back him enough. And then this same thing's happening over again. So no, none of us really wanted to be on this pod, did we? Well, maybe Joe did because it meant that, that Appleton had gone. But... Yeah, none of us want to be sitting here talking yet again about a relegation scrap in League One. So, yeah, it's the ownership. It's Andy Scott, it's Charlie Mevin, it's the rest of that bunch. They have got a huge amount to answer for. And I'm not convinced that they have the blindest idea what they're doing yet again, just like every other set of owners. Mm. Luke's pointed out that we've had uh, the same amount of emergency broadcasts as we have uh, clean sheets this season, only three. Uh, which is a which is a sad state of affairs, isn't it? Yeah, Tom just mentioned that the club have just put out a statement. Um, it is, yeah, there's not a great deal you're going to learn. It says it comes from the uh, the board of directors. Uh, it says our current league position and form over the last two months is not good enough. Doesn't match the ambition and investment of the club's owners or the expectations of us as a board, the club staff, and you, the supporters. To arrest our recent form, the decision has been taken to relieve uh, men's first team head coach Michael Appleton. Uh, and the uh, the coach, uh, Richard O'Donnell, from their roles. Uh, our search for the next head coach is underway, given our current position and the ambition of everyone at the club is vital. We get it right. Uh, we get the right appointment to lead Charlton forward. In the meantime, it confirms that Curtis Fleming will take interim charge, supported by Jason Pearce and Stephen Henderson. Uh, it says Curtis is a very experienced coach, while Stephen and uh, Jason have a real understanding uh, of the club. They said appointing a new head coach is a key priority. They say, again, we're also well aware that the transfer window still has a week left. Um, they've already signed seven players this month. They're still looking to further strengthen. Uh, as always, they say the transfer activity will be overseen as it has throughout January by the technical director, Andy Scott. would like to thank you for your continued passionate support and assure you that everyone is working hard to turn things around on the pitch. And yeah, obviously the name Andy Scott's come up there. I mean, someone put, put in the chat, uh, Stephen just said, why do we keep referring to Apples as the manager? He was the head coach. He took instruction from Scott. That's a real issue here. Obviously, we um, we know that. It's, um, the Appleton was brought in as head coach, Joe, and by Andy Scott, you know. And uh, again, after the recruitment at the start of the year, which has left us a bit short, albeit obviously they came through halfway through the window, 
uh, and and now a couple of managerial appointments that haven't gone well. I guess there is a lot of going to going to be a lot of scrutiny on Andy Scott and, and and what he does next. Well, I said on the on the uh, show when we uh, were here, sort of talking about the appointment of Appleton, that Scott nailed his colours so firmly to the mast for this appointment. All of the language was that this was going to carry us to a new horizon of great things and that we were no longer a losing club. This is the platform we were going to move on from. And he only ever set himself and Appleton up for failure with that. And now he's in a position where he's going to have to, you know, 13 days after a vote of confidence was given, he's got a sack of manager, he's got to go and find someone else again. And Curtis Fleming, my understanding is from, from the outside is that he was um Scott's man as well so even even when he does have a manager in there he's he's looking to appoint someone else to look after the manager he's appointed he has that much confidence in the job they can do so he's you know the only thing that he's done so far to the T of what he said he was going to do is he said he was going to come and sit above the manager and provide some continuity and transition he's now on to his third manager his second interim setup so that's his fifth coaching structure he's been here i think seven eight months so that's a pretty spectacular achievement um in such a short period of time but he's going to have to get this appointment right and we've got to get a manager just like we've got to get a squad that is going to get us out of this league and then cope and stand on its own two feet in the division above and i just don't see how he's going to find that in the position that we currently find ourselves in should should he be under pressure then knife andy scott yeah, I think I think um, I think you'll be under a little bit of scrutiny, and I think that comes with the territory, doesn't it? I think you criticise players for poor performances, you criticise the manager for poor tactical decisions, so you'll have to criticise the the person who's hiring all all of those players and managers underneath him. So yeah, he's going to be feeling a little bit of pressure, as Joe said. He nailed his colours to the mask with you know appointing up, and I don't think it was his first choice, which speaks volumes. But um, yeah, he, he was he was backing him, and you know in that. Q and A that we had on that Wednesday, it was uh, they were backing in, which I get to an extent. You know, I think when they were bringing players in, um, I can I can get why they were backing him. But I also said on Sunday at the same time, you still have to win games in the in the interim period, and you can't carry on losing games because football's not not a forgiving sport, and we know what happens, and that's ultimately what has happened. So, yeah, he'll be under pressure, but he's just going to carry on and do what he's going to do, isn't he? He's not going to resign or anything, so we just have to crack on. And hopefully we get the, the right the right appointment next time. Or we'll be back in for another emergency one in a few months' time. Yeah, well, Time Traveller says, I don't want coaches, I want management uh, and leaders. It's a joke, although if they are a real Time Traveller, they can go and tell us who the, the next gaffer is and we can all go and stick a couple of quid on and uh, win that one. There was a good point here from, from Braun, um, says, don't excuse Appleton by saying he was just a coach. It was the technical setup, the poor set pieces and the poor defensive work rate that was the main problem. And that comes straight uh, from Appleton. Yeah, I mean, I put the question to him. The last, so the last time I got to speak to, to Michael was obviously after the game against Burton um, last Saturday, Ben. And, I was, and uh, I was speaking to him about the fact that Lloyd Jones had made exactly the same mistake two weeks in a row. And he, he highlighted it the week before. He didn't close down Mason Clark for Peterborough. And he didn't close down Helm for, for Burton on Saturday. You know, that that is tactical. You know, at, at some point... With all the defence, you see managers go into clubs all the time and they see a defensive unit that's not working. I know there's there's managers out there who are known as specialists for this, but they go out and actually drill a little bit of organisation into a back line. And Michael is unfortunately one of, of a long line who's been unable to do that. You have to do what you've got with the tools at hand, even if we're finding out maybe they're not as good as we, as, as people thought they were. Yeah, totally. I mean, if you look at the excuse of, okay, we've got injuries, our first choice back four haven't been injured this season. So apart from Hector just getting injured recently, and we've obviously just brought these two new boys in, um, we haven't had the injuries there. So that's what winds me up when we say about the injuries. It's like we probably haven't had a problem scoring goals. We haven't gone, ah, oh, do you know what? Yeah, well, if we would have had Chucks and Miles, we might have scored a few more. But it's it's letting in goals. That's where we're struggling. And he was a defender himself, wasn't he? He's changed it uh, um, to three at the back in the last few games. And look what happened last night. First goal, it was two on two. Then one of our players slips over. Second goal, as Nathan uh, tweeted out, same goal we're letting in. <laughs> Ball comes in. Guys got unmarked. 
and basically side foots the into the net. What do we do? So, again, another reason for his sacking. He just cannot set up this structure of defence, the game management to hold on at the end, to put the extra defender on or three at the back or just to have two blockers in the middle of the midfield. It just doesn't work. So, yeah, that's, that's where you lose trust in a manager if you just can't hold on to that. So, yeah, Jason Pierce, Curtis Fleming, they've got a big task to try and get that to give that defence some confidence going into Saturday now. Yeah, right. Jake says it's not just managerial recruitment. We haven't got a commander on the pitch and we're two fullbacks short. Andy Scott's positional recruitment has also been poor. We've got a ludicrous number now uh, of mid midfielders. I mean, it was, it was telling really in the Q&A with the board a couple of weeks ago, Sue, when I think it was Jim Rodwell who made the point that, you know, this, this is however many years of decline that would be we're in. It's not just one person's fault that, that we, we're on a bad run. I think he was referring to Michael Appleton at, at the time, but... You have to look, I guess, at the, at the structure and the setup of everything behind the scenes, and that that's got to provide the the manager or the head coach with the the tools to to go and do their job properly. So, I mean, how, how, do you feel the club have set us up to to fail almost with some of the recruitment we had at the start of the season? Are they trying to put that right now? How do you see it? I think, like we've talked about it before, and and I guess in defence of the current board, there was a lot of undoing that needed to be done behind the scenes in terms of finances um, and basic organisation and structure. I think the probably where the issue lies is where they've possibly made some rash decisions in some aspects, but then not put enough, enough thought into others. So um, I think it's already been mentioned that damage has been done, started years ago, isn't it? But, and this is just another board that's got to come in and pick up more pieces to the ever-growing pile of mistakes. But it's, it's, it's difficult to know what's at the heart of that, the, the lack of um, clarity around that structure around the the team because actually and I've said it I've said it numerous times on paper we've got some very very good players and there is no reason why we shouldn't have been challenging for playoffs what is it about the mentality or the structure that is not working and getting the best out of these players because he isn't the first manager that's failed to do it I know more recently we've had some sort of more stronger um names come in uh players wise but it there's something somewhere that's not right and i guess we don't know because we're not on the inside but we keep getting this oh yeah this is the one this this will work it out now um we just got to go on from here and it's just it's like groundhog day and it's hard to really understand how and why that's happening to a club that historically had been very well organised and very stable. Mm, yeah, it's an interesting. I mean, you, you say you, you, we have some good players. We certainly do have some good players, but I mean, is there anywhere near enough quality pulsing through the entire squad? I, I, I always say, we as Charlton fans and as fans of any club, you, you probably you get so used to watching your players, and obviously you want them to be the best because your supporters. I, I do wonder if we overrate some of our players, and I do wonder if you know we, we're looking at parts of our side that are clearly weaker than than a lot of people realise. Because you don't statistically, if we had players for a playoff push, we would have made one at some point in the last three years. And I just think the amount of turnover there's been shows that probably we aren't at that level. If you look at where our players end up after they leave us as well, I, I, I think we overrate our players in that case. So Dan Finch is saying, uh, here's my concern uh, with Andy Scott. He's effectively chief scout, but you know he's a technical technical director director isn't he but he's also on the board I don't see how that works for us and I guess a lot of that comes down to, to the structure of the the ownership and the management the board and all that Mark it, it is a, it is a slight it, what feels like a bit of a rare beast in terms of the board selected the owners in like they they, they got together and it's like let's get some let, 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 let's show some people that we're going to run a club for them people perhaps who don't know a great deal about football the the people who are the money men and they rely on the current board to continue making decisions now it's early days still, Suggest you'd have to suggest, but you know who, who who's going to turn around and say that 
that if Andy's not doing a good job or Jim's not doing a good job when they sort of manage themselves? Do the people above them know enough about it, Mark? Uh, probably not. I mean, uh, the thing now is to get to the end of the season and stay in this league. That's the number one priority. It really has to be because to, to drop down to League Two um, would just be beyond, well, apart from giving everyone else in London a laugh, which would just be terrible for us. Um, but you're right. I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's leaving foxes in charge of a hen house sometimes because while, the, while they're still doing it, they, they don't know any better. And, you know, they're sweet talk in the um, boardroom. Oh, all we need is this. All we need is that. But you've got to show the results. Um, unfortunately, it probably will come down to somebody being binned out of it and probably take a nice financial package and walk off and again we seem to be like you said groundhog day and it does seem to be like that every season for the last how many seasons now and we've had very few episodes or periods of time where you've actually felt upbeat and lifted and it's 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 so depressing sometimes and it's you want to see a, a, a shimmer of light, a, a glimpse of something in the future. And the way you look at the clubs being run and you're just confused, you're thinking, well, what, what are you going to prove? And it's, they might be looking at people now, but who, who's going to talk to them and say about, you know, the, how the club's going to be going forward. Any players now are going to be looking at us and going, what? And the players they've brought in, who have we brought in who is literally match fit and ready to go? I mean, I thought Ladapo last night was, off for pace, he, he, he did have a touch. I think he had two or three chances, and he's just gone over, he swung his boot at it, and I was thinking, look, I know he's not everyone's first choice, but surely if he's not fit and he's not matched up to match speed, keep him on, bring him on for half hour at the end, and he can run around, bully people, a bit like Chucks does. But, you know, let's start, if you want to go with two, start with Kanu, because I guarantee you, Kanu would have buried one of those chances that the Dapo had. But the same with Fiorini came in and didn't look anywhere near up to speed with with a, with a, a, a proper match. So, yeah, players have come in. I mean, a couple of bright sparks last night. I like Reg. I thought he did well. And the uh, McElfie. But it was just such a gap of the back. But I think when you've put in so many people, and there's a new communication thing. It's, it's difficult to say, right, we want an instant result, which is what we need, unfortunately, but I just can't see where it's going to come from. Mm, right, a couple of tweets came in. Ted saying, uh, now we've got rid of Appleton, we need the board to seriously look at Andy Scott's position. He is, after all, the architect of this current uh, debacle. Alan said it was four weeks too late, uh, but have to go all out now to get Nathan Jones. Loved how he got Luton pressing aggressive and on the front foot. Uh, also think he would get the fans on board uh, and something for us to get behind. Uh, Chrissy said, uh, in my lifetime, uh, we've been at our best when the manager has a Charlton man. I count Lenny Lawrence uh, because of his South London origin and length of service. The next appointment needs to be long term. They also need to be allowed to manage and not quote. Uh, Damien says, I can't help but think uh, this feels like a washing machine spy uh, cycle uh, that we've spun many times before. On a human level, I felt for Appleton last night. Uh, he should never have been appointed in the first instance. Let's hope the new appointment is made quickly. Onwards to Blackpool. Uh, I'll be there for my sins. He says, P.S. You've got a great show sponsor. We certainly do, Damien. Thank you for your support. And uh, Malcolm points out, we need a coach to try and keep us up in League One first and foremost. I mean, We'll talk more about um, who we want or who we think might come in next after the break, Tom. But I mean, we're in a right relegation battle. I, I feel stupid now, even going back to Saturday when I said you know, seven points certainly feels a lot harder, a lot, a lot wider than a four-point gap with games in hand below us and our fixture list coming up now, five against the top seven in the next, in, in, five, five of the top eight in the next seven games, I think it is. Something like, like, we're playing a lot of good teams now, starting with Blackpool Saturday. Obviously, we'll be making our way up there as well. That's, that, that's a tough, that's a tough one. We're, we're right in a dogfight now, Tom. And have, have we got enough in us to, keep our heads above water when you look at the run of results we're on doesn't look like it does it you look on on that pitch there's not for all of Appleton's faults and there there were a hell of a lot of them there's there's so little confidence in that team there's nobody I would say properly leading properly grabbing each other properly sorting each other out although maybe now Apples has gone we saw that kind of little huddle they did at the end of the game yesterday and maybe they are going to going to pull themselves out of it 
Um, but I honestly don't know. The February fixture list is is tough. Um, and yeah, going back to you feeling stupid, I put a tenner on us to win the league. So, <laughs> so how stupid do I look? But at the time, that wasn't mental. You look at the state of this league this year. This was our chance this year. This was our chance to have a really good go at it because most of the good teams were gone. And I have no problem in saying this. The rest of this league is awful and we're just sunk to their level. This is not a case of us being particularly bad or the league being good. This league is bad this year. That game last night was one of the worst games of football I've ever watched and we've still managed to go and lose it. And that is embarrassing. So if we're going to sink to this level, we might as well sink to the bottom of this level and go. Because we looked at that run from Burton, like somebody mentioned, and we went, well, Orient are down there. Uh, who else are we playing? Bristol weren't anything special. Port Vale were nothing special. Burton themselves weren't. And look at them all just doing us over every single week. So, yeah, I said I didn't want to come on this pod. I said I, I just don't care anymore. As far as I'm concerned, let's go down because I, I just I just don't care. I just am I'm, I'm so fed up with it all. Let's have a let's have a season down in League Two because maybe we'll actually win some games. Because the way I see it, I just don't know where our next win is coming from at the moment. To be totally honest with you, I cannot see it because. Last night was the pinnacle of just everything bad about us. Everything bad. And I just, yeah, where do we? Where does it come? We're not going to win in February, surely, against the teams we're playing. I, I just don't see it. Mm, we'll see. Uh, John's saying, can you cash that bet out? Um, yeah. <laughs> Luke's saying, HMS, lose your money. Um, right, let's have a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we will um, talk more about who we think... Uh, might be coming up next. Stay tuned here uh, on Charlton Live. Thinking about a new kitchen or bathroom? Find professional, independent local installers with free home surveys, itemised quotes and protected payments, trading standards approved contracts and workmanship warranties. The British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom, Bathroom Installations accredits installers to ensure they are police checked, fully insured and experienced. Take the risk out of home improvement. Visit bikbbi.org.uk. Hello, fellow addicts. I'm so excited to tell you all about our micropub, The River Owl House. The River Owl House is based in East Greenwich. It has six pub of the year awards, an ever-changing selection of amazing beer. It's owned by Charlton fans, walkable to the ground in just 20 minutes with buses that go direct to the Valley too. If your match day routine includes a drink with your friends, you must join your fellow addicts in the river. See you soon. Right, welcome back to Charlton Live. This is a mer- an emergency broadcast on a Wednesday evening, looking back at the fact that the Addicts head coach uh, was dismissed, Michael Appleton, after last night's 3-2 home defeat uh, against Northampton Town that makes it 10 games without a win. We are now just four points uh, above the drop zone uh, into League Two, where Tom says he, he's, he's kind of tempted to want to go. But I think realistically, we all know it's going to be an absolute disaster. Um, so let's... Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Joe, I'll start to talk about some of the names that are out there. Um, the first name we've we've seen publicly linked, and it, I think it was almost immediately last night, is, of course, Nathan Jones, the um, the, the former Luton Town manager, had spells uh, elsewhere with Southampton and with Stoke in his managerial career. Obviously, he's had, uh, had um, coaching roles, including at the Valley, before. Um, what's your initial reaction to his link? Do you think, do you think that's a realistic one? Uh, and uh, is there any other names out there you'd like to like to see thrown into the mix? Yeah, before I come on to that, I will just say, Tom, if we do get relegated to League Two and we still can't win a game, imagine how bad you'll feel then. So um, don't 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 wish your life away. Um, that, that, uh, is he optimistic? Is he possible? Possible? I don't know. I mean, he, he, it's one of those, isn't it, where. He he's currently hasn't got any money coming in. So would he like some money coming in? Probably would. You know, would he like the size of job for the size of package that you get coming here? Probably not. Uh, but he would tick the box of ex Charlton. He would tick the box of having experience at a high level. He would tick the box of being able to get us out of this league potentially and take us up to the league above. Um, if we ever got Premier League quality, um, he said himself he struggled a little bit and he showed them too much respect. But I think that's a dream that's a long, long way away for us at the minute. So we won't worry about that too much. So uh, for me, uh, I'm, I'm less concerned with the actual name. I'm more focused on the the character and the ability. And I want a coaching staff that's mixed, varied people with different skill sets who can, you know, focus on defensive game, attacking game, 
set pieces really set us up to understand opposition to adjust tactics during the game and and a manager who we think is going somewhere you know they they can step up the league with us and if we do part ways for whatever reason it's because somebody higher up leagues is coming in to poach them and I don't think we've had that for a long long time I can't remember the last manager that we've had who's left us to go to a level beyond where they managed us at and and that is a shocking indictment that we've been hiring people who are very much treading water at the level that we're at as a club and and as a club we can't afford to tread any more water we need to start moving forwards and and you need a squad on the pitch and a squad on the touchline that are enabled enable you to go through those leagues in, in the right way mm. i think nathan jones is probably one of the only sensible names and duff as well that could maybe do that yeah, I mean, Duff is out there. I mean, obviously, uh, Sue, Sue's going to kill me for this, but I'm going to play devil's advocate with, with Nathan Jones. Obviously, he'd done a superb job at, at Luton. Um, both, both times he left Luton, they were fine without him, though, and continued continued without his influence. And then he went to a couple of roles where he didn't do very well, Nath. So, uh, obviously, we saw what happened at Stoke. We saw what happened in the Premier League with Southampton. Um do you think he's he'll still have? I mean, I think he'll still have to fight for the job if he was interested. If he is genuinely interested, I think he would be an expensive appointment, so it might not be an easy one to get over the line. But do you look at? I guess if you're going to look at what he's achieved at Luton, you have to look at where he struggled elsewhere as well. To be fair, yeah, yeah, you've you've got to do both. But I think it's the point of not who we want; it's who actually wants the job. I don't think you're going to have a massive queue of people who are doing really well and have had a lot of success and go. I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll throw a grenade in the mix and go down Cholton for three months, to be fair. So I think you just got to, we've, we've got to try and get someone with experience. And Nathan does have that. And he does have that Cholton connection, which we always seem to do well about. But ultimately, we just need to win games. Unfortunately, you're not going to have, as much as I'd love someone to have a manager who's had not endless success, you're always going to have someone who's done well, like Mike Wapperton. He didn't have great success, but he got into playoffs. He's done bits and bobs, but he's not been a superstar anywhere. And I don't I think we just need to peel it back a little bit and remember we're a mid-table League One club. I've seen people banging on about Steve Cooper. I mean, really? Like, come on. Um, so, but I, I'd, I'd be happy with Nathan. But I said yesterday, I don't really care anymore in terms of who's it. I just want him to come in, sort the defence out, because that's what's needed, win games of football, and then go again in the summer. Because at the moment, we're just spiralling and, I just think we need someone with experience as much as I love Jet Pierce and I don't think it should be him to the end of the year because I just don't think it's fair on him. Um, and I think we all bang on about youthful players and go, you know, they're inexperienced when he's to dip them in and out. If someone's a young manager, the last thing they want on their CV on their first job is getting Charlton relegated to League Two, which is the lowest we'll ever be. So um, I just want someone with experience. Yeah, Nathan ticks those boxes. Michael Duff does. Uh, is it Michael? Yeah, Michael Duff or whatever. There's a few out there, but again, it's just whatever they want to do. Like the main thing I'm going to do is just get behind the players because they're going to need us more than ever now. Um, and hopefully we can do that and try and get away from that toxic atmosphere, which I understand why there was. But that from now on, I just really want it to be optimistic so we can get behind our boys. Mm, yeah, we just we, well, we need we we need the the groundwork done, don't we? Mark says, uh, uh, given our performances against Cray and Gillingham, let's keep away. Uh, from the lower leagues and then Valiant said yeah we basically drew 1-1 with a council estate in that game against Cray Valley I don't know if anyone is on, on the Facebook group which I do I cast my eye over every now and then someone legit at me uh, suggested that we go for the Cray Valley paper mills manager Steve McKim earlier but someone else pointed out in the um, in the comments he might be busy with his day job as being a cabbie like come on like, we, we're at that sort of stage of the, of, of the process where people are throwing any old names out there obviously Bo's a name that's been thrown in by a few people that's what, who Andrew would like to see her. again you know Richard ruled him out last time and he's already said he seems pretty happy with his managerial role with Montserrat and again like Rich don't just make that up um yeah Tony's saying oh where's that gone Tony's saying if we don't invest in a proven manager and first class recruitment structure to build character uh, then we're finished um obviously a lot of people speak about the the fact that we only seem to be successful under people with a Charlton history I mean that doesn't feel like a like a, a, something that should be true but it is you know are you one that may, maybe the the leeway you get bought by seeing someone that, that has been linked with the club before is was that important to you Ben or, or does it just really matter with experience and, and what they've achieved in the game 
Oh, well, I think if you look at that, then in previous experiences and in the past, it has worked, hasn't it? I mean, instantly we do have a common like factor with them. We've either seen them as a player and got love with them, like Jacko um, and like Lee Bowyer, obviously. <laughs> Although it was a bad memory when he left, I remember being a kid. Um, but look, that it's kind of a bit lucky that these guys have done well in a way, and it probably just proves they're they're good managers. I think Jacko's gone on now, and he's doing well with Wimbledon this season. Um, Boyer went on to do okay, and it doesn't seem like he's that fussed about regular management anymore. Um, Curbs obviously went on to be a fantastic manager. Um, obviously, one name linked who I I would be interested to see if he got a job is Gary Rowett who was here before as a player, not too long after his bad injury he got. Um, but no, I don't think it should be a factor um, because I think sometimes we can get lost in that. I mean, how many times over the years have people tried to call for Curbs or Chris Powell to come back? You can't go back in the past and get those guys. They've moved on. Chris Powell enjoying a coaching Royal Sheffield Wednesday now. So, yeah, I don't think that's going to be a big factor for us at all. Um, we need to get someone... With experience, and I agree with Sue. I think our team isn't that bad. It's definitely not where we should be in the table. So we need someone who can fire these players up and get the best out of their potential and their ability. Uh, we're mm. not in a firefighting stage right now where we need someone to come in because we need eight points to stay up. We need someone who can hear for a long project. So get, if Pierce yeah. is the man for a few games until we find that, then, yeah, he is someone the fans can get behind, a Charlton man that can help. Again, you know, our team's not that bad, but what what level are we talking? Like, if our team was just a mid-table League One team rather than what well, is currently a relegation battling League One team, I'd still see that as a bad side, you know? <laughs> like, that there's... That there's got to be more, more, uh, more, more to it. Um, right, let's have a look at some of the comments. I mean, uh, Spam said he's legit. Give it to Steve Brown, but uh, I get the impression that Brownie wouldn't be up to it uh, or up for it, even not up to it. He, he wouldn't be up for it. Uh, yeah, Andrew's saying maybe it might be Nigel Pearson and Jason. You obviously a lot of conversation about the fact that Curtis Fleming is uh, is already in the building, and then Yuli's name got linked. Um, by Rich yesterday, said he'd be pleased to come back. They, those two both work with Nigel Pearson. Uh, at Bristol City. I mean, is, are there any names out there, Sue? I know you're just going to throw Nathan Jones at me again, but uh, as well as Nathan, is there anyone else you'd like to see? Uh, Tony Chapman's Eber knows the players, uh, knows the club, doesn't she? Yeah, but I mean, any, any legitimate ones out there, Sue, that we might not have mentioned yet? Um, No, I mean, I'm, I'm just reading through the comments and, and Nigel Pearson has been coming up quite a few times. I think what what Ben was saying is like it doesn't necessarily matter if it's not someone with a Charlton connection. What you want from a manager or a head a head coach is passion and an understanding of the club and the fan base, so that you can instill that in your players. Like I know years ago, and I don't like the past is past, but Kurtz every time he signed a new player. He used to play him a video of the history of the club. And a lot of the lads used to say that was massive to them because they really understood why we are the way about our football club. Um, and I think a lot of that has been lost. And I think if potentially, if players and managers were to understand what we've been through, not just in the, the, the recent history, but way back to the 80s, or even before that, they might actually understand why we feel the way we do about our football club because we've always been at the heart of everything that's happened. And so I feel like that that could give players and managers an extra kind of boost in that, right, they fought, they fought for the club. We need to fight for the club. Um, so I think you can't... You don't like you say, like managers that have got a child connection, there's not going to be loads of them out there that are at a level that we need them to be. So, I'm I am I know I've said Nathan, but I've got my own reasons for why I've said Nathan. Um, I think people are sort of saying about Johnny, 
I wouldn't necessarily go there again with John. I think, again, maybe in the future, but he's still sort of learning in League Two, where we don't want to be, Tom. Um, so, yeah, I think, I've I, again, seeing some of the names, like, no one's really standing out for me. I've, I guess if I was going to go with anyone, possibly Nigel Pearson with Jason Yule assisting, other than Nathan. There we go. Interesting stuff. I've just had a, a tweet as well from Charlton Exile saying, uh, have we dismissed Gary Rowett? He did a, a good job at Millwall uh, with a small budget. I mean, interestingly, we were just on, me and Joe were just on Radio London just before we came on here and Brownie was on at the Fulham game and you know, not breaking any confidences here. He said it on air. He said he absolutely wouldn't have uh, appoint Gary Rowett when, and then not really went into it further. Uh, so that was an interesting one. Signal saying Scott Parker only because it would really wind up Terry uh, every time he had to say his name. Imagine those interviews after, blimey. Uh, Alex Gleeson saying, what would you think of the appointment of John Eustace? Uh, or we could have the other former uh, <laughs> Birmingham manager, Wayne Rooney, according to Jay. Uh, Mark, do you have a do you have a, a preference out of all of any of those or any of the names we haven't mentioned? Is there anyone you, you specifically don't want? I know I think Lee Johnson will be high on the list for a lot of people. I I can't see that happening at this state uh, at this moment. But what would you reckon? Oh, the list of people I don't want is immense. I could literally fill, you know, a couple of A4 pages I've seen today because you know you've been scrolling online. Sam Allardyce's name's come up. Neil Warnock's name came up. You know, you might as well throw Joey Barton in the mix there as well. And just like Troy Deeney. Yeah, this is all yeah, all, all funny and all trolls, I should imagine. Um, there are a couple of other ex-Charlton players who have got their managerial licences. Alex Dyer's got his. Jonathan Johansson has been managing. And he's always got an interest in the club. Um, personally, I, I like the idea of Jason Yule, whether it's with Pearson or it's Yule coming in. He was, a, you know, a great player for us and he was learning his trade as well and he's, he's carried on. So I, I wouldn't be upset, you know, obviously I'd I'd go with Brownie. I was thinking of Rowett, but, you know, I, I would bow to Brownie's superior knowledge of a man. So, but no, the one which made me spit my tea today was Sam Allardyce. I'm like, yeah, really? You know, you might as well throw Ted Lasso in the mix if you're going to put imaginary characters in to become manager of us. Mm. Uh, Robert Robert says Duff or Pearson uh, are top two at the moment. I, I know he's thrown out a, a couple of tweets relating to, to those perhaps have, have maybe been spoken to, although obviously it's, it's still very, very early days. Um, we haven't really got into to Michael Duff, Tom. Obviously what he achieved with Cheltenham was very good. He got Barnsley to the, to the playoff final, went uh, all wrong um, with... Uh, with Swansea, of course, Chris pointing out, I think, very correctly that we're in a relegation battle. It's not the time to be experimenting with Yule as a manager. And I do wonder if he, like, if, if his link was to come in as an assistant. That's my guess. But, yeah, um, Duff, is he one you like? I like, I like the idea of Duff. Like, I'm not really in a position to go, would he fit our squad? Because I'm still not entirely sure what our squad is is marked up to try, what sort of play, football we're, we're trying to be moulded into yet while we're in this little transition phase that seems to be going on in this January but I mean from from what he's achieved previously would would, would you have a look at Michael Duff oh, I mean who knows he's a, he's an all right manager isn't he but I, I I don't know how to answer that question until the ownership come out and actually give some sort of some sort of idea of what they're doing if if Andy Scott is going to stay as a director of football or whatever he's calling himself which in it in itself seems to be a problem based on this season then surely the idea is that he then dictates roughly the playing style and the players that come in and you bring a manager in that fits that. And if that is the case, then why why are you going with two different managers who play different styles and can bring their own... Well, I don't know if they can bring their own players in, but why are you bringing in completely different styles of player? Why are you bringing in Michael Appleton and then setting up with a 5-3-2 or 3-5-2 when Tenai Watson and Teo Eden have been two of the poorest players all season and you're relying on them for width? Why are you bringing in 155 midfielders in January when you're only playing three of them at any time? It, do it doesn't make any sense. So people are obviously joking about Jose Mourinho, but you can throw his name in the mix because until there's any sort of structure, it doesn't matter who the manager is. If you're asking me if I think Michael Duff's a good manager, yeah, I think he's done some all right stuff in his time. But I could have said the same about lots of the others. Ben Garner was doing a good job at Swindon when he came in and they gave him about three weeks to change to a passing style of football. I know that was previous ownership and then when actually now I changed my mind. 
So there's there's just there's there's it's almost pointless having this discussion because none of them are given any chance. None of them are given any chance. Whoever comes in now, you're either bringing someone in emergency now to save us from relegation, hopefully or not, depending on how I'm feeling. And then you sort it out in the summer, at which point you give them all of the summer and you stick with them for sake and actually give them some time. Or you bring someone in now and you dictate the play. If Andy Scott's going to dictate, then he has to dictate and tell them the style. I don't like that style. I don't think it works. But until they've sorted out what this model is, and I'm still not really clear on that, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, but in a short answer, Michael Duff's a good manager, I think, at this level. I don't know what more I can say than that, really. I don't know if he'd be any good for us because we've had plenty of managers that I think are OK and they've proven that they can't do it here. And largely, that's not their fault. And I'd include Appleton in that, although I think he obviously made plenty of his own mistakes as well. Mm, yeah, Dan saying for me it's Gareth Ainsworth, uh, Michael Duff, Nathan Jones, Mark Bonner, or John Eustace. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'd want Gareth Ainsworth uh, personally, um, but you know, it could come back to bite me. Luke Linham's pointing out Michael Appleton's available, 500 games in his career, knows the the league well. Yeah, I have heard he's just um, he's, he's just come onto the market uh, once more. There's, there has been a couple of people. So yeah, Andrew Flynn is saying. The Bromley manager, Andy Woodman, our former goalkeeper coach, Jay said Andy Woodman as well. Obviously doing a very good job at Bromley, but has he, has he got anywhere near the league experience to step up into us at this moment in time? I, I'm not sure about that. I think um, Joshua said it as well, our guest fan on on, on Saturday. I'm, I'm not saying that because I want Andy to stay at Bromley either. Obviously, Charlton is my number one priority. I just don't think he's in a position to step up into this mess at any and, and have the experience to, to learn how to deal with it uh, at, at this moment uh, in time. Yeah, Josh is saying definitely uh, not, not Ainsworth now. Um, we should talk about the actual game last night, Joe, and, and just in the last few minutes of the show, look ahead to, to the Blackpool game. Um, the performance and the, def- the defending again. And bear in mind, we did have two new defenders in that back three, and then Jones got taken off. Presumably, we didn't get to speak to Michael Appleton after the game because he was otherwise engaged with like a cardboard box and photos of, and stuff or, or clearing out his desk. Um, so we don't know if Jones came off because he was injured or because, again, he made another mistake that led to a goal. The first goal, he was horribly out of position, tried to play offside, got caught out. Um, so I am still concerned that defensively, we are an absolute disaster. And I don't think that bodes very well for, for Blackpool on Saturday. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there was a there was a little stretch yesterday um, where I was just saying n- number is unmarked, number is unmarked, number, and I went for about two minutes straight with always being able to point to someone else who was then standing unmarked, and and that is that is case in point our problem. We seem incapable of finding our players when we've got the ball, and we seem equally as incapable of finding their players when they've got the ball. And if you give people enough time and space, they're going to pick you apart. And I thought Northampton yesterday were okay in the first half and shocking in the second half. Uh, we had a few of their fans in the river after the game and they were saying that they were they were quite keen to hold on for a draw, even when we were down to 10 men. So it, it shows you sort of what they thought about how they were playing and, and where the game was going. And yet we still contrived to find a way to throw it away right at the end. And these fragilities, and, and I said it earlier um, on, on uh, BBC Radio London, that, that these are the same patterns week after week after week after week. And <clears throat> I am very critical of managers. Time and time again, I'll be critical of them when the thinking's not there. But at what point does your professional, personal pride as a defender or a midfielder out on that pitch come into it, wanting to mark your man, wanting to stick your foot in, wanting to show that you really care and that this is something you really want to do. And I thought Dobbo was pretty much the only player that came out last night really exemplifying that as as an individual and potentially there's reasons for him doing that. But we've got to find a way to stop leaving ourselves so open against what are very average teams, no disrespect to any team in this league, but every person said at the start of the season, this is the weakest league one that we've seen in decades. And yet we are contriving to be one of the weaker elements of it. And looking forward to Blackpool, you just know that Albie, having come on and gifted us uh, two goals back into it by uh, just not being able to keep up with play, is going to be looking to pick one out from the halfway line. And uh, that I just don't think I can bear. 
Mm. Um, yeah, I, I'm just looking at a couple of the emails that come in as well. Teddy's um, asking for our, our thoughts on the on the appointment of Pierce and, and Fleming. Obviously, for the foreseeable foreseeable knife, probably a bit late in the show to start this uh, this this thread of, of conversation as well. But I did say it on BBC Radio London, it, it was weird that that Curtis Fleming came in when he did because clearly not an Appleton appointment. Clearly, they tried to do similar with Powell coming in for Holden. You know, almost parachute someone in. Who, who's not known to the manager. And I do wonder if that undermines the manager to an extent. You know, maybe two weeks ago, Michael might have felt undermined and that didn't help with what happened with the squad. And we saw the squad didn't go off with him at the end yesterday. Again, if you're reading too much into that. But yeah, what, what can they achieve between now and Saturday, the long trip up to Blackpool, to to make sure that we don't go there and, and get our backsides handed to us, now? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, Pierce knows... I've... Well, he should get his boots on, to be fair. Um, but obviously, I know he's not going to. But I think all you can do, really, is just try and pick the lads up and just try and say it's like a clean slate. That's all you can do, really. And you have to work on your defensive shape and set plays as they normally would. They're not going to be able to do a massive amount. They're not going to change in terms of formations, probably back to something random or whatnot. Um, so there's not a lot of time. But yeah, I don't know about the Pearson one either. I thought we had an... Um, a bad back injury or something so I didn't know if he was out but yeah I, I, they can't do much mate and yeah I think Fleming coming in it did seem a bit weird at the time and I think it's proven now because if O'Donnell's gone and Fleming stays then I think that wasn't a uh, suggestion from Appleton it's probably one from Scott so interesting how that's um how that's come about yeah, just on Nigel Pearson. Yeah, so in, in, in the closing stages of his Bristol City career, he was on crutches and he, he had a problem that did require um, uh, surgery. And I sort of had a look before the show to see if I could find any updates since then. There doesn't seem to have been any public one unless anyone knows differently. So we don't know exactly where he is in terms of uh, his fitness, which is, I mean, we've had fitness problems with players. We might as well get a manager in as well who's injured. Um, ben, uh, just, just looking at how, how important is it that we get something at Blackpool on, on Saturday just for a, some sort of feel-good factor? You know, it, it, was, it was quite interesting, the reaction that the players got at full-time yesterday, because I think if it wasn't so much hatred directed towards Michael Appleton, I think quite a fair bit of that squad would have got more stick than they did at full-time. But actually, there was there was a, almost a, a, a unifying moment where they stayed out. Obviously, Dobson, there's loads of stories going out about George at the moment that maybe we'll discuss further on, on Sunday. Maybe we'll know more by then about his future. Um, he was out there clapping. Obviously, Alfie, who, who just is a leader on the pitch, um, and I think has been an absolute credit to the club since he joined. He was, he was part of that as well somehow they they have to try and keep us on side and whoever the manager is some of them need to play better to, to do that and it needs to start Saturday Ben oh yeah does it I mean I have just seen who's got the best home form in the division and it's Blackpool isn't it similar to when Jacko took over from Nigel Adkins and we went Sunderland away and they had the best home record I don't think they'd lost all season and we went and won there. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen this time, but um, oh, it would be massive. We we definitely need something going into this February. I mean, Reading's our next away game two weeks after that, and they just beat Derby last night. So, yeah, that'll be massive because they're down there with us. So, yeah, we need to grab something from somewhere. Um, and whether it comes from a change in formation, some players that are fresh, but... Yeah, we, we need that togetherness. The fans want to be together with the players, but we need to see that desire from them as well. As as play, uh, people have mentioned in the comments, the players need to own up for, for this season as well. It's not just Appleton's fault. It's their fault as well. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a reset button, isn't it, now? And, and we need to try and get points from wherever we can going into this month. And we, we know we can because we've shown we can score goals. It's keeping them out. Mm. Luke said, I heard that Nigel Pearson's watched Charlton's last 10 games has asked for surgery on his eyes instead. Excellent. Well, we'll end the show there, shall we? Um, yeah, as uh, Andrew's pointed out in the chat, no show tomorrow then because obviously we've done one uh, this evening. So we'll uh, our next show will be Sunday when we look back at the game uh, against Blackpool. And well, let's hope that something something can change for us in, in, in quick time because the longer this goes on, the, the further the danger that we get sucked right into that bottom four and uh, the unthinkable starts to uh, be
become thinkable. Right, um, massive thanks to everyone who's joined me on the live stream this evening. That's Joe, Nath, Ben, Sue, Mark and Tom. Great to speak to all of you guys. Thanks to everyone in the chat, all your comments and your emails and your tweets. I've got to as many of them uh, as possible. Make sure you subscribe to Charlton Live on our YouTube channel uh, and on our podcast apps as well. Never miss another show. Um, yeah, we've really enjoyed having you guys come along for the ride with us uh, this evening. Give us your thoughts on Saturday's game. Uh, for Sunday's show uh, when we'll be back on YouTube live at 10 a.m. Uh, in the morning. So I'm Louis Meadows. Thanks for listening to Charlton Live, sponsored by the British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom and Bathroom Installation. This has been our emergency broadcast. There has been another dismissal at uh, the uh, Valley. Michael Appleton leaving his post as the Addicts head coach. We shall see you again on Sunday. 